Next, the two 7.2 meter diameter magnet coils are installed. With a current of 1,800 amps, they generate a magnetic field of two Tesla. The rectangular vacuum chamber is fixed inside the magnet. A system of large vacuum pumps is installed to evacuate the 25 cubic meter chamber so that protons can circulate unimpeded. This is followed by the installation of two D-shaped electrodes inside the vacuum chamber. Together with these electrodes, a radio frequency generator creates the electric fields. that accelerate protons from a source inserted in the center of the vacuum chamber. In summer 1957, the synchrocyclotron is ready. And CERN's first accelerator comes to life. The purpose of the synchrocyclotron is to produce and study new particles. Before accelerators were available, such particles could only be observed in cosmic ray experiments. The new machine accelerates protons to 80% the speed of light, producing millions of new particles when those protons collide with a target, giving scientists the opportunity to make systematic measurements. Operation of the SC requires a sequence of actions. Massive pumps extract the air from the vacuum chamber so that protons do not collide with gas molecules during their acceleration. In the proton source, hydrogen gas is ionized and a cloud of protons is injected into the middle of the synchrocyclotron. The accelerator makes use of magnetic and electric fields. The magnetic field is produced by a current of 1,800 amps flowing through the coils of the huge magnet. Two D-shaped electrodes with opposite polarity are fixed inside the vacuum chamber in the middle of the magnet. Protons have a positive charge and are drawn towards the negative electrode as they traverse the gap between the electrodes. The magnetic field forces them to follow a circular trajectory and they return to the gap after one half turn. Meanwhile, the radio frequency generator reverses the polarity between the two electrodes. The protons are now attracted to the opposite electron and gain more energy. This process is repeated over and over again. Every time the protons make a half turn, they are whipped around faster and the radius of their path increases. After more than 100,000 turns, they have reached an energy of 600 million electron volts and move at 80% of the speed of light. They are now close to hitting the target and the first experiment can begin. Young scientists from all over Europe arrived. Among them are Maria and Giuseppe Fidecal. Giuseppe wants to study a short-lived particle called the pion. In 1957, there was a mystery surrounding the pion. Theory predicted that a direct decay into an electron and a neutrino should happen, but this had never been observed. Phenomenology, what we see, of course. Only uh, in, later on in uh, 1957, uh, uh, when the, with the, the uh, theory, the uh, female Ivan Rousset theory, the, the, uh, the, the problem was really had some kind of uh, uh, solid uh, theoretical uh, basis. So at the moment, uh, the, the, the absence of uh, the pi EDK was very critical. It was essentially a block for the physics to, to, uh, to go through. It was really felt like that, uh, like a block. And uh, was at that time, uh, in uh, January 1958, uh, that uh, I thought that that was the right uh, moment to, to do this type of experiment. Giuseppe and his team set up a clever experiment. The pilots are stopped in an apparatus designed to study their subsequent decay. 
1958, only a few hours after they start the experiment, the first pictures show clear evidence for this rare decay. I can imagine, imagine. Well, that was really exciting. You know, it's surprised that can be sky. I mean, it was something essential because I was yeah, seeing something for the first time. You know, it's a secret before. This first important discovery spread CERN's name around the world. Over the following years, scientists at the SC continued to make many important measurements on particles, atoms, and nuclei. 1967, a new idea takes shape called ISOLD, an isotope separation device. Protons from the synchrocyclotron collide with target nuclei that are split into short-lived fragments, which are then rapidly scrutinized in experiments. The study of such short-lived nuclei with too many or too few neutrons helps to understand how heavy elements are produced in explosions.